Que que tanse unusakut. Hello et bonjour. First, want to acknowledge that I am joining you here today from the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I'm joined here today by uh, Associate Deputy Minister uh, Valerie Gideon and uh, Deputy Chief Med Medical Officer uh, um, Evan Adams. <laughs> Sorry, on by. Uh, um, online, so great to have him here today offering uh, an update on Indigenous communities. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking once again Indigenous leadership across the country. So much has been done in terms of organizing logistics for delivering vaccines, educating community members about the safety of vaccines, and keeping people's morale up during the crisis. And this week's COVID-19 case count once again reflects the hard work. As of April 6th, First Nations communities on reserve in provinces were aware of 635 active cases, which is once again a decline from last week. This brings us to a total of 25,174 confirmed positive COVID-19 cases with 24,249 cases recovered and tragically 290 deaths. Continued uptick of vaccines with Indigenous communities is a large contributing factor to the decline in active cases in addition to the continued respect of public health measures. As of April 5th, 257,279 doses have been administered in 620, 612 rather, First Nations, Inuit and territorial communities representing 60% of Indigenous adults in First Nations and Inuit Nunungat. Earlier today, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization released its full statement on its extended dose interval recommendation. The statement provides the detailed evidence and complete analysis that supports the recommendation to extend the time between the first and second dose of COVID-19 vaccines of up to four months. Extending COVID-19 vaccine dose intervals will optimize early vaccine rollout and population protection. It will do this by allowing many more people to gain protection against severe COVID-19 outcomes since they will receive the first dose of an effective COVID-19 vaccine earlier. Présentement, plus de 60% des adultes autochtones ont reçu au moins une dose unique du vaccin contre la COVID-19 dans les communautés des Premières Nations de l'Inuit Nunangat et dans les territoires et plus de 70% de la population adulte a été vaccinée dans les territoires. En Colombie-Britannique, tous les résidents admissibles des communautés des Premières Nations se sont fait offrir leur première dose, leur première dose plutôt, un accomplissement majeur. Au Québec, toutes les communautés des Premières Nations ont ouvert des cliniques de vaccination et quatre communautés ont commencé à administrer leur deuxième dose, les autres devant commencer dans les semaines à venir. Bien que ces progrès soient encourageants, nous devons rester vigilants. Les récentes mesures de confinement prises en Ontario, notamment Colombie-Britannique et au Québec, nous rappelle que la pandémie n'est pas terminée. Les variants sont préoccupants. Ils peuvent se propager plus facilement et rendre les gens encore plus malades. Ils augmentent rapidement. Tout le monde doit encore porter un masque en public. Lavez-vous régulièrement les mains, de, on le dit depuis le début, avec du savon ou utilisez du désinfectant pour les mains. Je sais que nous traversons une période extraordinairement difficile et pendant la pandémie, nous nous en sommes sortis en étant là les uns pour les autres. Continuez donc à prendre soin de vous et de vos familles, de vos proches. I'd like as well to take the opportunity today to say a few words on child and family services. The Government of Canada is continuing the important work in full partnership with Indigenous peoples to reform child and family services so that every Indigenous child has the opportunity to grow up in their communities, immersed in their cultures, and surrounded by loved ones. This is why last week we announced the launch of a call for proposals to support Indigenous peoples communities and groups as they begin work to develop their own legislation and explore Indigenous-led models for child and family services. More specifically, the funding is intended to provide support for Indigenous peoples, communities and groups wishing to explore models and options to exercise jurisdiction and develop Indigenous child and family service legislation systems and programs prior to entering into tripartite coordination agreements, discussions with federal, provincial or territorial governments as applicable. The funding is critical to supporting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities who want to use the Act to both affirm jurisdiction, advance new models of child and family services, and ultimately will support more Indigenous children and families being able to stay together. 
through the July 2020 economic statement and fiscal snapshot, the Government of Canada committed over $542 million over five years starting in 2020-2021 to support the implementation of the Act respecting First Nations, Inuit and Métis children, youth and families in full partnership with Indigenous partners. Of this investment, a total of $425 million will be allocated over five years in capacity building funding. As communities develop their laws, specific funding will also be made available for their participation in tripartite coordination agreements to further advance these models. These discussions will be essential to re reaching agreements between Indigenous communities, the Government of Canada, provinces and territories to provide services to children and their families, and they will also ensure a smooth transition from the existing system to the one envisioned by Indigenous communities free from racism and discriminatory practices. By supporting family preservation, we're also supporting language preservation. Strong family connections ensure continuity to Indigenous cultures, traditions and languages for generations to come. Pour conclure, aujourd'hui, nous célébrons aujourd'hui la Journée mondiale de la santé. Le thème de cette année est construire un monde plus juste et plus sain pour tous. La pandémie de la COVID-19 a mis en évidence les écarts croissants en matière de soins de, soins de santé qui laissent souvent les communautés des Premières Nations Inuit et Métis mal desservies. La pandémie de COVID-19 a plongé davantage de personnes dans la pauvreté, dans l'insécurité alimentaire et amplifié les inégalités entre les sexes, les inégalités sociales, les inégalités en matière de santé. Cette Journée mondiale de la santé est un appel à l'action pour éliminer les, éliminer les inégalités en matière de santé dans le cadre d'une campagne mondiale visant à rassembler les gens pour construire un monde plus juste et plus sain. Je tiens, je tiens donc à réaffirmer l'engagement de notre gouvernement à réduire l'écart entre l'état de santé des Autochtones et celui des non-Autochtones. Chaque membre des Premières Nations, chaque Inuk et chaque Métis mérite de bénéficier du même soin de, niveau de soins de santé de qualité que tout autre Canadien. Ces soins doivent être accessibles et dispensés dans leur communauté, doivent être plus pertinents, et en, en, intégr en intégrant des modèles de connaissances spirituelles, culturelles et traditionnelles, et qu'ils soient justes et respectueux, sans l'influence de racisme, ou la discrimination. Nous continuerons donc à travailler avec nos partenaires pour combler les lacunes en matière de santé, d'éducation et d'emploi. Des lacunes qui empêchent un trop grand nombre d'Autochtones de réaliser leur plein potentiel et de contribuer pleinement à leur communauté. Miigwech, merci. Nakumek, merci Cho. Thank you. Over to you, Evan. Thanks very much. Uh, I've just quit from the unceded territory of Tla'am and First Nation, which is near the city of Vancouver. Um, as of April 6, there are now 635 active cases uh, amongst First Nations on reserve, which continues a 10-week trend of declining numbers of new COVID cases. And where um, uh, new cases, or sorry, where, where um, sorry, sadly there have been 290 fatalities. The case fatality rate is less than that, uh, less than half of that of Canada's general population. Uh, we continue to have good success uh, with vaccinations in First Nations communities, where over 250,000 doses administered in 612 communities. Now over 50% of adults living on First Nations reserves in Inuit Nunangat and in the territories have received at least one dose. Uh, I personally would like to acknowledge uh, the resilience of our communities and community members and of their uh, leadership and the ongoing collaboration of communities with provincial governments uh, and the federal government and with all of the many workers uh, who are tasked with addressing COVID-19. Canada has received 10 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines, and that will continue to increase uh, over the coming weeks and months. I'd also like to mention the Battleford Agency Tribal Chiefs, Inc., and the Saskatoon Tribal Council, and Prince Albert Grand Council in partnership the Saskatchewan Health Authority and Indigenous Services Canada 
are running mass immunization clinics in North Battleford, Saskatchewan, and in Felbert. The clinics uh, will have the same eligibility criteria as other SHA sites with an emphasis on urban officer First Nations people. In Manitoba, Long Plain First Nation has begun mass vaccination. Chief Dennis Meaches uh, received his vaccination and noted he took the vaccine to be an example for the elders and for the people in their community. Emma, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, this is what concludes uh, today's speeches. We will now uh, take questions from the journalists. Uh, one question, one follow-up. Nous allons maintenant prendre les questions des journalistes. Une question, une question suivie. We will start by questions on the phone. Nous allons continuer avec les questions au téléphone. Opérateur, c'est à vous. Thank you. Merci. Please press star one on your device's keypad. If you have a question, faites Étoile 1, si vous avez une question sur votre appareil. Faites étoile 1 sur votre appareil. The first question is from Jamie Pasha Gumscombe from APTN. Your line is open. Hi, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miller, for taking your questions. Um, I'd like to speak a little bit on hesitancy. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, you said that there are no indications of uh, vaccine hesitancy in uh, Indigenous communities. Um, and if I could go into the Cree Nation of the Cree Nations in Quebec, where they said they have a 77% uptake, which is really good. But there are pockets, uh, for instance, like the First Nation, the Nemesca First Nation, uh, where you see the uptake is rather low. Now, are you aware of any other cases, There's cases such as this? Because they're reporting that some doses are getting wasted. Can I have your response to that, please? Yeah, and th thanks, Jamie. I'd, I'll ask... Uh... Dr. Gideon or Adams to to complete my thoughts. Uh, what we've seen in the aggregate on the whole is um, is really exemplary work across Canada. High uptake in communities going um, going as high as as the high ninety percent. Um, it, it's a testament to the work that's been done by Indigenous leadership to to get as much information into people's hands so that they can make uh, make a choice. And the choice is overwhelmingly yes to get this vaccine. Um, indigenous communities have known from the get go the odds that they're fighting overwhelming odds compared to non-Indigenous communities, and, and, and they're answering the call when it comes to the priority uh, deployment of that vaccine, Jamie. Um, there are pockets. I won't deny it. Uh, we shouldn't deny it. Uh, but what we've seen is, is, is when we work with those communities that for one reason or another um, have, have a level of, of, of caution with respect to the vaccine, um, we, we, we see really good work that can come from it, and, and then people coming back and, and deciding to take um, the vaccine, but it goes through um, a respectful engagement, um, making sure that Indigenous health leadership is at the forefront of the decision-making process, um, and 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 making sure that that offer is there. Um, and so, um, I wouldn't say I'm not worried, but I, I'm very very optimistic about uh, about some of the work that's being done to make sure that people are protected and that they're protecting uh, those that are most vulnerable. I, Valerie or Evan. I, I don't know if you want to complete that. Sure, I can, I can share. We do, <clears throat> excuse me, regularly connect with our uh, Deputy Minister uh, colleagues from provinces and territories to check in. And as the Minister noted, we are seeing uh, in some uh, provinces and territories that they're going in sometimes two to three times uh, rounds into communities to be able to uh, build up uh, trust and credibility. And there are some uh, discrepancies in some, um, in some regions, like variations essentially with respect to uptake, uh, particularly among the younger age cohort of 18 to 30 year olds in some communities. Uh, but education is making a difference and working in partnership with uh, a community representatives uh, to address any questions or concerns that community members have and giving some time uh, some space for people to make those informed decisions and coming back to let them know that the opportunity remains for them and that support remains for them to actually uh, be vaccinated is an effective strategy. Uh, Dr. Adams, do you have further thoughts on hesitancy? Yes, it is. It is an unfortunate reality that it is difficult to achieve 100% um, vaccination rates um, it would be um, really nice if we could vaccinate um, everyone very quickly. 
Uh, we should expect some hesitancy, and we should expect uh, pockets of hesitancy because uh, uh, not all communities are the same. So um, as has already been said, um, doing outreach and um, providing uh, credible, reliable, reassuring um, information to those who are still on the fence and uh, continuing to give opportunity for vaccination uh, is, is at the heart of the work. Um, I think what we're seeing now, we did worry for a while. Uh, I think we were worried um, that there would be a lot of hesitancy. It doesn't seem to be um, quite the case. I would say generally our vaccinations have been quite highly accepted and we would like to continue to do better. And we mean that for um, all Canadians. I think it's really important as well for um, Canadians to speak to um, trusted sources, to um, family members um, about their concerns so that we can air them, so that we can learn from them and they can um, make decisions that they can live with. Did you have a follow-up, Jamie? Uh, yes. <clears throat> I guess I could follow up by asking, I, you're saying that the, the cases are declining in uh, in uh, First Nations communities. Now, what is the county for this? No, um, I, can, uh, I can begin. No, go ahead, Dr. Oh, go Sorry. ahead. No, please. You're the doctor. Oh, yeah, the, uh, the, the number of active cases has been, has been dropping. And as I was trying to say um, earlier, the, uh, the number of people who have gotten better has been outpacing the number of people with new infections. That's been extraordinary. And there has been a drop. Uh, we've been uh, quoted last week as saying more than 80% uh, from our highest point in mid-January, but we're actually closer to uh, um, a drop of 85% now. And we think that these low number of um, new cases must be related to um, our early um, work in getting uh, first nation people vaccinated. Of course, it's a number of other factors as well, but it certainly must be related to our success at vaccination. And to add to that, Jamie, I mean, there is a strong correlation to the early vaccine deployment in Indigenous communities, and I would, and probably very strong causation. But I would, you can't, you can't underplay or underestimate the work that um, the Indigenous leadership has done to deploy um, all the public health measures in communities to to really drive down the five thousand um, active cases that we saw um, in January to to what is about six hundred right now. It, it's really amazing work. Um, it's not one single factor for sure. It's nice to see those vaccines getting out and getting high uptake, um, but those public health measures are playing a role and those public health measures um, do come with a cost. So I, I don't want to uh, underestimate uh, the, the work that's been done in, in making sure those get and continue to be observed. Thank you, merci. Prochaine question, next question. Thank you, merci. Next question is from uh, Willow Fiddler from the Globe and Mail. Line open. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, so in terms of the vaccine rollout, we're kind of in Ontario seeing this disarray happening um, with the general public. When you speak about the success that you've seen in the First Nation communities, and we've seen this with Operation Remote Immunity in Orange, um, you know, what, what can be learned from the efforts that we've seen from uh, the First Nations leaders? And is there, you know, is the department doing anything with that information, with those uh, plans, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, how, how will that be used for uh, future work for work for whatever reasons? You know, one of the, one of the takeaways that I hope we don't forget coming out of this uh, pandemic willow is that if we trust uh, indigenous leadership and in this case, health leadership, uh, the outcomes are better. Um, you know, now we have proof points. It isn't um, something that anyone can hide from because we have the facts in front of us. We, we know that when um, we work together for, for, for a cause uh, that, is, that is common, the outcomes are better and the trust is better when we trust the people on the ground that know best how to protect their people, in this case from uh, a historic pandemic. Um, that hasn't come without challenges for sure, uh, and we keep learning as we go. One of the important learning points that we faced in late November, for example, is shortening down the reaction time between when a community 
for through no fault of its own becomes overwhelmed with COVID, uh, the reaction time where we start deploying extraordinary measures such as the armed forces. Um, if you shut, close that reaction time from, from five days to two days, you prevent hundreds uh, of cases of COVID. Um, we're learning as we go. The work that Orange has been doing in Northern Ontario is, is amazing. Um, it isn't even or, or identical as we go from province from province and territory to territory. And there are lessons to be learned uh, on the go, but um, on, on a longer term basis as well. As, as we as we look at the data unfolding in front of us, um, this, these are all things that it, it's difficult when you're operating in real time to reflect about the uh, sort of long term arc of the of the epidemic. But there are many lessons that we can learn from both successes and failures as, as we go on. I don't know if any of my colleagues want to offer any thoughts, Valerie. Sure, I would. I, you know, thank you for that, Willow. And we do have, I think we've mentioned a few times, a, a federal, provincial, territorial, indigenous vaccine planning working group that has been meeting since the beginning um, on a weekly basis and really share what's happening across the country. And there's a specific urban uh, focused uh, working group as well. Um, so people are sharing their best practices and we are documenting uh, what is happening. You can probably see all the papers around me uh, on a regular basis, but we have a we have a national plan that is really intended to tell the story of how things we were planning would unfold and now updated to say how things have been unfolding and will continue to unfold. And we do hope that um, you know all this information will continue to guide uh, not just immunization efforts, but also overall emergency uh, planning and health responses. The collaboration uh, with provinces and territories is absolutely fundamental to success. Um, and, you know, also being able to be heard by the expertise of medical officers of health across the country of the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has also made a substantial difference from what we've seen in previous pandemics. And then I would just say that, um, you know, from the positive stories that have been told by Indigenous communities, you know, on Facebook or uh, through various media, uh, you can tell that there's a very personalized approach to the effort. Uh, so people are uh, not just demonstrating uh, their own ownership over the success, uh, but they are also making sure that the time has been taken for people to be oriented to it. Um, I think one of our uh, colleague Indigenous uh, physicians has talked about it like a bit of a Disneyland tour where you greet people and take them through the process. Um, you know, you offer food, you have artwork and teachings and information in their language. And it it it, it is a different experience. Um, it is a very human experience. Uh, that people are having uh, in this context. And so they feel safe and they also feel valued uh, because they have been prioritized and because their community has had the space and the opportunity to demonstrate that leadership. Do you have a fo follow-up, Willow? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I'm just curious, what kind of data is the department tracking for the vaccines um, in each community? I understand um, the communities that are being serviced by Operation Remote Immunity, for example, aren't um, submitting their data to the provincial COVAX system. Um, so I'm just wondering what ISC, uh, yeah, what kind of what kind of data are you guys getting from the communities as they administer their vaccines? I'll start Willow, and then perhaps. Um Dr. Giddy can complete. The, it's 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 through a variety of means through the working tables that we have with the provinces and and, and indigenous communities, um, as well as through open open uh, open sources. Um, it it isn't perfect. It is by no stretch of the imagination perfect, uh, but it's something that we are trying to calculate in real time to get a sense of what is uh, what is penetrating into a community and their relative um, their their relative level or percentage of, uh, of, of vaccination. It's key not only to longer term policy that you alluded to earlier, but real time action and reaction with respect to perhaps communities that aren't as, um, that where the art uptake isn't as great, or perhaps that have higher um, youth proportions of the population, which is um, a, a, a growing challenge, obviously, um, which hopefully will be met with, with, um, with an enlargement of the vaccine dose to younger uh, younger younger age groups so um 
it depends again uh, by province. Manitoba has has a robust reporting system that um, is, is 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 reliable, um, but it is something that we're working on in real time and gathering and and, and collating and, and putting together. Um, so um, the, we can expect in the next couple weeks that for this data, quite frankly, to lag a bit as the mass vaccination uh, de deploys throughout communities. Uh, but again, um, we're quite confident in, in, in that 50 to 60 percent number of in, uh, Indigenous people, adults uh, on reserve or in Inuit Nunangat that have had uh, at least the first vaccine. Again, knowing that that is uneven as it, as it spreads out in different communities or throughout the province. I, I would echo the minister's comments. I think, you know, we, we do, it's a balance of also respecting the different approaches of communities. So, for example, uh, the communities under the Northern Intertribal Health Authority in Saskatchewan, we're not receiving sort of community breakdown data with respect to uh, vaccinations, but we will see uh, aggregate numbers, right? And so, you know, we... we um, but it does speak to the importance of continuing to work in collaboration with provinces and territories to disaggregate uh, the data that they do have because um, so that we can know, for example, in some of the lar larger urban centers, uh, you know, how many Indigenous individuals have been uh, vaccinated. So that is information that is very difficult to get to if there isn't a collaborative effort um, that involves the provincial or the territorial government. Uh, Dr. Adams, do you have further thoughts? Um, yes, I, um, I think it would be a, a phenomenal legacy from this pandemic for us to have uh, a real-time public health data collection system for Indigenous peoples. And it is actually quite reassuring um, the functionality of those data collection systems in, in certain um, provinces, uh, for sure. Uh, there's still some work to be done for it to be um, perfect, uh, but it is um, it is really an accomplishment to see um, almost in real time uh, the number of vaccines um, going to Indigenous people. Uh, uh, Currently, so um, I am uh, quite proud of the, the collection that's been happening at a community level, um, at a regional level, at a provincial and territorial level, and um, uh, gives us a view in uh, into how it's going in communities. And I think uh, our communities um, see the value in uh, participating, in cooperating, and collaborating, in uh, sharing their data because they, they want to know themselves. Uh, how are we doing? Thank you. Merci. Prochaine question. Next question. Thank you. Merci. Next question is from Zach. Oh, just one moment, please. Um, we had a question from Zach Vercero from Saskatoon Star Phoenix. If you want to ask a question, please press star one again. Okay, so he canceled his question. Back to the floor. Hi, we'll now take questions from the room. Good afternoon, Mr. Miller. It's Man Hamidi with the Canadian Press. Almost a year ago, you acknowledged that it has been hard to measure the, the impact of COVID-19 indigenous populations because of a lack of enough data, especially uh, among those living off reserve. What actions have you taken to improve this and what kind of data we are still missing? Yeah, and look, it's an, it's an excellent question. I, I think that our... Um, when I made that statement a year ago, it was with respect to um, the testing process uh, and, uh, you know, each jurisdiction having its own way of reporting and ticking a box when someone goes in to get testing. And <clears throat> the challenge then was uh, to identify the prevalence of COVID among Indigenous communities, um, not only on reserve or in Inuit Nunangat, where we have a good sense and a good relationship with authorities to get um, an idea of, of of who is Indigenous, um, as well as who is actually doing it. So we had a sense of, of what those numbers were. What we didn't have a sense was, was, was the positivity rates within Indigenous communities. Um, 
at the point of testing in, um, in non-Indigenous communities, so downtown Montreal, Winnipeg, um, Toronto, Vancouver, um, and that is one that is done by the province. And each province had their own way of identifying what is what constitutes someone that is Indigenous for that. And, and you can look at the different testing sheets. I've looked at every single one uh, and how they report um, Indigeneity or don't. Um, and and it, it's confusing and, and the data isn't necessarily good or reliable. Um, it's gotten better um, our, through our relationships with the provinces, obviously moving in, in real time and, and getting a sense of how the pandemic is impacting uh, people. The, I, I would say that the, the best authorities in reporting and collating, uh, gathering that data are in, uh, in Manitoba and BC um, and um, with, 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 with um, different outcomes in, in, in other provinces. Um, but that has uh, informed our, our allocation of resources um, in real time as we get a sense of where those surges are occurring. Um, we saw the surges occurring in Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta um, throughout the winter period and, and still uh, still present now um, in terms of active cases. Uh, so um, while those aren't perfect, and as Dr. Adams mentioned, um, a national data gathering process is something that would be ideal, um, but it is a tremendous amount of work. Um, this same sort of process repeats itself with respect to the deployment of the vaccine. We have relative certainty in and around what is occurring um, quote unquote on reserve or in the far north, uh, less so in, in, in urban settings. And that is, um, <clears throat> that goes to the whole process of, you know, do you have to identify yourself when you, when you go in to get uh, your vaccine or is it simply because of what your age group is? So that, 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 re that remains incomplete, um, but we're hopeful uh, to be able to get a better sense of things um, as, as, as the vaccination process goes on. And again, it's always a, it's always a, a plight for, for, for more data, better quality data to be able to react uh, in real time. Thank you. Uh, there has been a lot of, like you said today, and Dr. Adams actually confirmed that cases have been declining in First Nations community on, on reserve. I wonder what, what's your message to those living on these reserves and wondering when they will get back to some sort of normality. When do you think, like, are you confident that's going to happen soon? As I, as I stated earlier, this, this whole process of getting vaccines into Indigenous communities is one that's foremost driven by science. It's, uh, it's driven by the fact that Indigenous communities are fighting overwhelming odds that COVID presents them. And we've cited numbers time and time again that it range from three to five times the incidence or propensity to get COVID, principally because of housing or health outcomes that we've talked a lot about. Um, that's been driven by, by the science. Uh, we've reacted as a government accordingly. I'm actually very proud to be in a country where uh, Indigenous communities have gotten vaccinated before me or the Prime Minister or anyone in the Cabinet under 70. Um, that's something I think Canadians should be all proud of. Um, there's a lot more work to be done. Uh, and when we talk about uh, when we talk about when we can relax the public health measures, this isn't the time to talk about it. We still don't know how long, one, the vaccine will protect people. We don't know uh, what it does on the incidences of asymptomatic transmission once you have the vaccine and perhaps contract it but have less severe outcomes. So there's a lot of unknowns there. And until, that, until we know or have a better sense of things, um, we need to adhere to the public health measures that are, are getting even more stricter as we speak in, on, in Ontario, for example. So too in Indigenous communities. Um, but they know that. Um, and so the, the message that we've had uh, for Indigenous communities is to trust your health leadership because that's the, the most trustful source of, of, of recommendations. Um, to your initial point with respect to the, uh, the, the penetration of the vaccine into Indigenous communities, it's been in the, it, it is still and remains uneven ac across the country. We want to obviously get to 100%. Um, but this is, this is something that we won't stop until, in, until we get there. And, and, and that's sort of the, the, way, um, the way that I see it going forward. Um, but it is, it, it is a day-to-day a -day continuous um, repetition of the message and, and relentless work in, in getting vaccines into communities so that everyone can get their first and their second dose. Comment on this too, if that's possible. Like, you think that uh, indigenous communities can get back to some sort of normality?
I think was that question directed at me? I'm, I can't quite hear very well. Actually, but I also I want your comment on this, if you, if that's okay. Yes, I think we're all wondering what the new normal will be. I think um, the way that we used to live more than a year ago is now behind us, and we wonder um, what the new COVID reality will be. Um, you know, maybe for um, generations to come. Um, I am personally um, hopeful, and certainly. Um, Canada has not been shy to say that Indigenous peoples and their safety and their health and well-being uh, are a priority in this country. And I think for some who are hesitating, uh, they remember a time where they were not a consideration within the health system, and those are um, painful memories and experiences. So I do feel like it's a new day, and uh, certainly uh, proud of Canada and other countries who have said uh, indigenous peoples uh, should be protected, and we will make that a part of our national pandemic effort. Merci, thank you. Uh, this ends today's press conference. Ceci met fin à la conférence de presse. Bonne journée.